Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The ARRL Board of Directors publicly censors the Southwestern Division Director. Ballots are counted in the 2017 Director and Vice Director elections. We will have the results. The League is seeking nominations for the annual Bill Leonard Award. Do you have any ideas? Ajit Pai agrees to remove barriers to wireless innovation at the FCC. Skywarn Recognition Day is set for November 27th. NASA is kicking off a year-long on-the-air event on December 11th. And those mysterious signals did not come from the missing submarine. We will have all the details. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our satellite reporter, Bruce Page, KK5DO, is on a well-deserved hiatus, but our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to discuss the Internet of Things and invasive botnets. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, discusses how a temperature-controlled crystal oscillator works. And we'll have an interview conducted by Hap Holly, KC9RP, discussing the current status of the Amateur Radio Parity Act with Hudson Division Director Mike Lisensko, N2YBB. That's all straight ahead as edition number 978 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Sitting in for the vacationing Don Hewlett, K2ATJ, and sitting in the air chair in Studio 2 overlooking the windy and chilly Empire State Plaza here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, not too far away from where the governor lives, I'm W2XBS. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and hoping everyone has now recovered from the Thanksgiving repast, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And from our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, acting on a recommendation of its Ethics and Election Committee, the ARRL Board of Directors has publicly censured one of its own. ARRL Southwestern Director Dick Norton, N6AA. On an 11 to 3 vote, with one member abstaining, the board adopted a resolution to censure Norton for criticizing the ARRL Code of Conduct for Board Members at an amateur radio gathering by virtue of his characterizations thereof, thus criticizing publicly the collective action of the Board of Directors adopting said Code of Conduct and drawing the board's collective decision-making into disrepute. The resolution cited multiple portions of the Code of Conduct that Norton was found to have violated. The board's action related to a complaint filed with the Ethics and Elections Committee by an ARRL member. The board met in special session by teleconference on November 14th to consider the matter. President Rick Roderick, K5UR, conducted the session. ARRL CEO and Board Secretary Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, and ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, were among those who attended the evening online gathering. According to the resolution, fellow board members had cautioned Norton that his actions and his manner in criticizing the code of conduct for board members were not acceptable and cannot continue with no notable change in his behavior since that time. Norton had been provided with a copy of the Ethics and Elections Committee resolution dated September 7, 2017, and responded to it in writing, accompanied by statements of four ARRL members who supported his response. The board found that Norton's violation of the ARRL Code of Conduct had caused harm to the League and provided sufficient cause to publicly censure Norton for unacceptable behavior as an ARRL board member. Mr. Norton is admonished by the board that no further similar behavior will be tolerated, the resolution concluded. 
The minutes of the special ARRL Board of Directors meeting have been posted on the ARRL website. The votes are in and the ballots have been tallied at ARRL headquarters in contested director and vice director elections. Here are the results. In a two-way race to fill the Dakota Division Director's Chair being vacated by Ket Olson, KA0LDG, the division members have elected Matt Holden, K0BBC of Bloomington, Minnesota. Holden, the current Vice Director, received 698 votes, while Dean Summers, K0ND of Dickinson, North Dakota, got 345 votes. Holden had been appointed as Vice Director in February of 2016 after former Director Greg Wyden, K0GW, became AWRL first Vice President. Olson announced earlier this year that he would not seek another term. In a four-way race for the Vice Director's Chair that Holden will vacate, the winner was Lynn Nelson, W0ND of Minute, North Dakota. Nelson earned 427 votes. Tom Karnaskas, N0UW of Owatonna, Minnesota, received 338 votes. Chris Stallkamp, KI0D of Selby, North Dakota, got 175 votes. And Jay Menard, K5ZC of Fairmont, Minnesota, picked up 93 votes. Nelson is North Dakota's section manager, while Stahlkamp is South Dakota section manager. Over in the Atlantic Division now, headed by Director Tom Abernathy, W3TOM, who qualified for re-election, ARRL members chose Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, as Vice Director. In the final tally, Hollingsworth of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, received 2,559 votes, while Lloyd Roach, K3QNT of Bedford, Pennsylvania, garnered 1,348 votes. Hollingsworth has served as FCC Special Counsel overseeing amateur radio enforcement. To the Midwest Division now, Director Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, was challenged for re-election by Cecil Miller, WB0RIW of Wichita, Kansas. The winner was Blockstone with 1,249 votes, while Miller tallied 792. Bloxham was elected Midwest Division Vice Director in 2011. Subsequently, he was the only candidate for the director's chair, succeeding Cliff Ahrens, K0CA, who retired in 2014. Vice Director Art Zeigebaum, K0AIZ, was unopposed for re-election. Running on a pose for new terms were Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, Vice Director Ed Hudgens, WB4RHQ, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, and Vice Director Tom Delaney, W8WTD. The Ethics and Elections Committee established the eligibility of all candidates and declared all unopposed candidates elected for three-year terms. That will start January 1st, 2018. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The American Radio Relay League is seeking nominations for the prestigious Bill Leonard Award. Created as a tribute to the late CBS News President Bill Leonard, W2SKE, an avid radio amateur and advocate for the service, the award honors three professional journalists whose outstanding media coverage highlights the enjoyment, importance, and public service value of amateur radio each year. Awards are given for audio, visual, and print and text journalism. The ARRL Public Relations Committee judges nominations, and the ARRL Board of Directors makes the ultimate decision announced at its January meeting. The award consists of an engraved plaque and a $250 contribution made in each recipient's name to a charity of their choice. Recipients will receive the award based on their work in English, covering amateur radio topics in an audio format such as broadcast radio or podcasting, a visual format such as television, movie, or other video media, and print and text formats such as newspapers, news websites, magazines, and journals. The scope of the work nominated may be a single story or a series. The work for which a nominee is considered must have appeared between December 4th, 2016 and December 1st, 2017. Only one submission per entrant will be accepted, and only one award will be granted for a team effort. Copies of the work for which the journalist is nominated must be submitted with the nomination. Submit entries to the ARRL Public Relations Committee, Care of Communication Manager, ARRL, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. 
Entries are due by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 1, 2017. For more information about the award or to, to obtain a nomination form, visit the ARRL website. In a key speech to the Cato Institute, FCC Chair Ajit Pai pledged, if someone seeks approval of a new technology or service that falls within our jurisdiction, we'll make a decision within one year. The FCC has had a reputation for delaying innovative wireless technology developments. New technology can take many years to gain approval. In 2013, the ARRL submitted the Amateur Radio Part 97 Symbol Rate Petition for Rulemaking RM11708. It sought to bring part of the USA ham radio regulations up to date so they matched those which the rest of the world had had for more than a decade. Four years later, the FCC still hasn't changed Part 97. In his New York speech on November 17, 2017, to the Cato Institute, Ajit Pai said, But these individual actions and others like it aren't enough. As I've often said, one of the most powerful forces in government is inertia. To ensure that innovators don't get sandbagged, we're implementing a new process. If someone seeks approval of a new technology or service that falls within our jurisdiction, we'll make a decision within one year. No more waiting indefinitely for an answer. This process is what's called for in a provision of the Communications Act, Section 7. You've probably never heard of it, and for good reason. It's been on the books for decades, but it's never been enforced. At long last, it will be. I realize that one year probably sounds like a long time to you, but it can be the equivalent of light speed in Washington's regulatory world. The lawsuit filed by former ARRL Eastern Pennsylvania Section Manager Joseph Ames, W3JY of Malvern, Pennsylvania, against the ARRL and several of its officers and board members was dismissed with prejudice by the United States District Court in Philadelphia in December 2016. For more details on this story, we go to Carl Pereira, KC1 HSX, reporting from League Headquarters. Ames filed an appeal of that decision, and on November 11th of this year, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit upheld the lower court's dismissal of the suit. In its opinion, the appellate court wrote, quote, because the record shows that Ames acted contrary to an August 2015 directive on at least two occasions, the ARRL statement that Ames repeatedly acted contrary to the directive is true and cannot support a claim for defamation. It is apparent on the face of the complaint and related documents that statements in the ARRL news article are true, and the district court therefore correctly held that the defendants established a complete defense to the Ames defamation claim and appropriately dismissed the complaint. Close quote. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. In June 2016, the Executive Committee of the ARRL Board of Directors relieved Ames of his appointments in the ARRL field organization, including his position as chairman of the ARRL National Traffic System Eastern Area. A free webinar, What is Skywarn Recognition Day and How Can You Participate? will take place on November 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can register online. After registering, you will receive a confirmation email containing information about joining the webinar. Skywarn Recognition Day this year takes place on Saturday, December 2nd from 0000 UTC until 2400 UTC, and it starts on the evening of Friday, December 1st in the U.S. time zones. During SRD, ham radio operators will set up stations at National Weather Service offices and contact other radio amateurs around the world. Participating amateur radio stations will exchange a brief description of their current weather with as many NWS-based stations as possible on 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, and 2 meters plus 70 centimeters. Contacts via repeaters are permitted. Skywarn Recognition Day was developed jointly in 1999 by the National Weather Service and the ARRL to celebrate the contributions Skywarn volunteers make to the National Weather Service mission, the protection of life and property. Amateur radio operators, which comprise a large percentage of Skywarn volunteers, also provide vital communication between the National Weather Service and emergency managers if normal communications become inoperative.
Medium Wave broadcast listeners recently reported a signal with continuous music and announcements on 648 kilohertz, the frequency of the former pirate broadcaster and soon-to-be reconstituted Radio Caroline. Listeners from the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Austria reported hearing the signal. Some reports, according to Mike Terry of the SWL Inc. Post, referred to a co-channel Romanian or Slovenian station. Terry said he believed the testing was done at a lower power level than the permitted one kilowatt. Our initial engineering tests on 648 have now finished, Radio Caroline announced on its website. Full tests and programs will commence in due course and will be announced here. We are grateful for the many reception reports sent. So many were received that it will take some time to assess them all. The latter-day incarnation of the famous shipboard pirate radio station that beamed rock music to the UK in the 1960s and 70s has gone legal and obtained a license to operate permanently on 648 kilohertz at 1 kilowatt ERP. That channel falls between the 10 kilohertz spaced AM standard broadcast band frequencies in the US. It's taken Radio Caroline 53 years to get an AM license, and it was perceived as a threat to the BBC for many years, Radio Caroline said on its website. Ironically, 648 kilohertz was best known for transmitting the BBC World Service in English. BBC dropped that service in 2011. Satellite signals heard over the weekend did not come from a missing Argentine Navy submarine, San Juan, that went missing on November 15th, dashing hopes that the vessel could be located the submarine had reported a malfunction, had surfaced, and was headed back to its base when the Navy lost contact with it. The sub, built in Germany in the 1980s, carries a crew of 44. Vessels from Argentina, the U.S., Great Britain, Chile, and Brazil have joined other vessels and aircraft looking for the submarine. A naval commander told media today that the submarine had surfaced and reported an electrical problem before it disappeared some 270 miles off the South American coast on its return to its base at Mar del Plata. Over the weekend, Argentina's defense ministry reported receiving seven failed satellite calls that officials thought might be coming from the missing submarine. No contact was made and no transmissions occurred. Poor weather has complicated the search. Over the weekend, IARU Region 2 news editor Joaquin Solana, XE1R, issued a list of marine frequencies suggesting that radio amateurs and SWLs listen for any signals that could be related to the missing San Juan. For a list of frequencies, visit the ARRL website. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The amateur radio clubs at National Aeronautics and Space Administration Centers around the U.S. have invited the amateur radio community to join the NASA on the Air special event, or NODA. NOTA gets underway in December 2017 and continues through December 2018. In addition to being the agency's 60th anniversary, 2018 will mark 50 years since NASA orbited the first human around the moon and 20 years since the first elements of the International Space Station were launched into low Earth orbit. Starting on Monday, December 11, 2017, amateur radio club stations at various NASA centers and facilities will be on the air with special event operations to celebrate these monumental achievements as well as current milestones. Some clubs will offer commemorative QSL cards and a special certificate will be available indicating the number of NASA club stations worked on various bands and modes. We plan to have a web-based system for you to check your points total and download a printable certificate at the end of the event in December 2018, the NASA announcement said. Points will be awarded for each center worked on each band and mode, phone, CW, digital, and space modes, satellites, meteor scatter, EME, ISS, and APRS. That would, of course, include contacts with any of the amateur radio stations on the ISS. Key anniversaries during NOTA include the 45th anniversary of Apollo 17 on December 11, 2017, which kicks off the event, NASA's founding on July 29, 1958, the 20th anniversary of the ISS first element launch on November 20, 1998, 
the 20th anniversary of the ISS Node 1 launch on December 4, 1998, and the 50th anniversary of Apollo 8 launched on December 21, 1968, and returned on December 27, marking the end of the event. Ham radio clubs at various NASA facilities will sponsor their own special events to commemorate and celebrate specific events. We hope to be on the air for casual contacts and contests as well. All contacts with NASA club stations will count toward your total, the announcement said. QSL cards can be requested from each club you work, and details will be on the individual QRZ.com profile page for each club call sign. The clubs include the Ames Research Center, NA2MF, Armstrong Flight Research Center, NA6SA, Glenn Research Center, NA8SA, Goddard Space Flight Center, WA3NAN, International Space Station, NA1SS, etc., Jet Propulsion Laboratory, W6VIO, Johnson Space Center, W5RRR, Kennedy Space Center, N1KSC, Langley Research Center, KG4NJA, Marshall Space Flight Center, NN4SA, Stennis Space Center, call sign to be determined, Wallops Flight Facility, W4WFF, and White Sands Complex, N5BL. More information is on the NASA on the Air website. Participating amateur radio clubs and the NASA on the Air event are independent of and not officially sponsored by NASA. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is This Week in Amateur Radio's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. If you've gotten the reputation for doing climbing work for hams, sooner or later the word gets out and you become everyone's friend. Some of your friends may have real need of your services on their towers and even on their roofs. Sometimes pleas for antenna help are hard to say no to. Here's how I handle those situations. If you're doing work for a close relative, do all the install work yourself and only use quality parts and install them to be bomb proof so a return trip won't be necessary. But for upgrades or severe weather repairs, I use an approach similar to this. I tell them, sure, I'll do the job, but since my safety is the most important part of the job, if at any time I feel my safety may be in question, I will stop doing the job and may decide not to finish the work. For relatives, I never charge for tower or antenna work, but always tell them my safety disclaimer. So if I stop, they know ahead of time why and agreed to my rules before the work started. This way, I'm never telling them no when they ask for my help. For hams in general, I tell them I will examine the tower first before I decide if I will do the job. When I get there, I examine the condition of the tower. I look at how it is mounted and the overall size of the tower, width and height. I do not climb those tiny TV antenna towers that are narrower than my two feet side by side. I tell the owner this before I get there. If the tower is bent at all or not perfectly vertical, I also decline the job. I have found that agreeing to look at the tower will save lots of guilt trips and sad stories. If you outline your criteria for rejecting jobs based on safety before going to see the tower, you can eliminate the dangerous jobs with the minimum of hurt feelings. When you do accept a job for a fellow amateur radio operator, take the opportunity to preach the gospel about safe climbing. Show them your belt and ropes and all your safety gear you've gathered over the years. I always keep mine covered in the back of the car so it's always ready to show. Just the sight of proper climbing gear impresses people the extent to which you value your personal safety. I take time to appoint someone to act as ground crew supervisor and charge them with keeping everyone far away from the base of the tower. If kids are present, I sometimes drop a screwdriver to impress them with what would happen to their heads if they hung around the base of the tower when something fell. While I'm on the subject of doing work for other hams, I'd like to mention a cheap and durable sidearm for the typical home antenna tower. I use inch or larger conduit and put a proper bend in one end, then clamp it to the tower. It is necessary to drill at least one hole and pin it to the tower to prevent rotating in the wind. I would ask a professional electrician to bend the conduit for me if you have no experience doing that yourself, since it is easy to kink it and ruin it. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. 
money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Jim Kovochik, K8JK of Brighton, Michigan, has been appointed as Michigan Section Manager for the first half of next year. His appointment will begin on January 1, 2018, and will continue through June 30th. Kovochik was appointed by AWRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fosaro, W3IZ, in consultation with AWRL Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, and outgoing Michigan Section Manager Larry Camp, WB8R. Camp, who has served as Section Manager since 2012, intends to step down from the volunteer position on December 31st when his term of office concludes. An AWRL Life member, Kovochik was licensed in 1968. He has been active in many facets of amateur radio, including public service, experimenting, and equipment restoration. He currently serves as an assisted emergency coordinator and a volunteer examiner. He is president, newsletter editor, and technical director for the Livingston Amateur Radio Club. Kovochik's appointment will bridge the gap until a section manager is elected in Michigan. According to the rules and regulations of the field organization, when a section manager vacancy occurs between elections, the position is filled by appointment. The Michigan appointment was necessary because no candidate was nominated to succeed camp by the time the deadline for section manager nominations arrived in September. The same situation exists in the AWRL East Bay, New Mexico, and Santa Barbara sections. Nominations are being resolicited in all four sections for candidates to serve an 18-month term of office starting on July 1, 2018. The resolicitation will appear in the January and February 2018 issues of QST. Section manager nomination forms and related information are also available on the AWRL website. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakava, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, kick it! The tech guy. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed. In, uh, we lived in Rhode Island, and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. And I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid, unusual. I would get up at six in the morning. Didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC. Reverend Billy Saul, Hargis, and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. My, uh, my mom, bless her heart, 83, has started posting pictures on Instagram. She's, I tried to get her into Snapchat. <laughs> Couldn't quite get her into Snapchat, but she got Instagram and she's been posting. And she posted a picture of me as a probably four-year-old kid. And I'm wearing, for some reason, I don't know, I guess I liked hats at the time. And I'm sitting in front of a record player holding 45s and playing records. And she said, yeah, you were doing this even when you were a baby. I always thought if, uh, if I had, were born in an era before radio, I'd probably have been a preacher. That's probably the closest thing, right? Every Sunday. See, I preach every Sunday, but I, I preach the gospel preach of technology. 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 Put your hand on the computer. We got coffee mugs that pair via Bluetooth to your phone so that you can then, what well, I don't know what, turn them up? Make sure your mug is in pair mode. Oh, I got to turn it off and then turn it on. and That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, one little tip I might give you guys, don't fill it with coffee before you try to pair it because the button is on the bottom of the mug. <laughs> so it's quite the balancing act. Found. It says it found it. Pair it and connect it. I've got this. This is from a company called Ember. 
It's actually a good idea. It's a coffee cup. This is a nice ceramic coffee cup. And then it comes with a coaster, a saucer that plugs in. The saucer has little uh, pins on it. You put the mug on the saucer <laughs> and it, it heats it up. And if you if you just use it, it heats, keeps the coffee at 130 degrees. So, I mean, if you don't like your coffee getting cold, that's nice. And then if you, <laughs> here's the silly part. If you pair it with your smartphone, which I haven't been able to do very well. I don't know why. Partly because I'm a lefty and the light is on the wrong side for me. But if you pair it with your smartphone, apparently you can control the temperature from your from the Ember app. A coffee cup with an app. What will they think of next? Criminy. I'm having a heck of a time pairing it, though. Is this now, is this an Internet of Things device? I guess it doesn't go on the Internet. Oh, God, I hope I can't control it via the Internet. That would be terrible. That would be ridiculous. Somebody could take my, boil my coffee. Uh, let's let's prank Leo. Let's turn his heater off. Uh, but I don't. I think it's just Bluetooth. <laughs> I hope it is. I hope it's not the internet. <laughs> that would be crazy to put a coffee cup on the internet. Actually, the real risk of these Internet of Things devices, your cameras, your routers, anything that goes on the internet. Your I have an oven that goes on the internet. The June oven. I have a I have a sous vide cooker. You know those those slow slow, slow cookers, the water bath cookers. I have a, something called the Mellow. I tweeted a picture of it uh, this morning, but I, but I bought it. <laughs> I bought it two years ago, <laughs> and they finally I finally got it. It's one of those you know Kickstarter things that takes forever. You know, fine. You, you don't know. Am I going to lose my money? Am I going to get it ever? Finally got it, and uh, that's kind of cool. So I have two two stakes in there. That thing is on the internet. <laughs> the stakes are being chilled right now. But I said it says when do you want to eat. <laughs> And I said, I'd like to eat at 6 p.m. And so an hour and a half before 6 p.m., 4.30 this afternoon, it will uh, it will go from chilling the steaks to cooking them. And they'll be perfectly done by the time I get home. How about that? You know what? It's, 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 a, I think it's hundreds of dollars. It's a crazy idea. It is a complete weight. It's so, this is so, I'm embarrassed to say I have this thing. But it's my, but it's, this is my excuse. So I tell my wife, but honey, it's my job. It's my job. I have to review these things. So the the best use of it, which is a completely trivial use, is for making soft-boiled eggs. Because when you go to bed, you just put two eggs in there. And then you say, I want soft-boiled eggs by 7.30 in the morning. And it chills them until like 6 a.m. And then it cooks them. And they're ready. And they're the best soft-boiled eggs I ever had. I know I can use a pot with water. I know, I know, and it'll be ready in three minutes. I know, but this is this is on the internet. This is on the internet, and that's I guess my point is that these devices. Okay, so it's on the internet. So somebody could cook my eggs hard cooked if they if they hacked it. That's not the threat. The threat is not that somebody's going to boil my coffee in my internet connected coffee mug. That's not the threat. The threat is these become a gateway to your home. That once. If, and we've seen, believe me, this happens. We've seen people uh, find flaws, lots of them, in a variety of these devices that are connected to the public internet. That means they're sitting there just waiting. Uh, in some cases, it's something as silly as they have a hardwired login and pass phrase. So bad guy just looks for these cameras, for instance. This happened with cameras. That's embarrassing, the cameras. In fact, there was a whole uh, internet website with cameras you could just turn on in people's houses millions of them you just because the pass the password was was hardwired so you could just go see somebody's FOSS cam oh let's see what they're up to that's a problem but again that's not as bad as the the larger problem which is it's a gateway to get into your internet and from there get into your home network and from there try to hack all the devices in your house and the one you really want to be careful about the ones are your computers and your phones your phones have everything nowadays. If you think about it, this, by the way, why law enforcement is so anxious to get Apple and, and, and Google to stop encrypting the contents of the phones. They'd love to be able to access this because if they've got a crook or a suspect, that phone has everything. They don't have to say, where were you on the night of August 17th? They just say, hey, phone, where was he? And the phone has, your phone has a complete GPS record of everywhere you've been. It has a microphone and a camera on it. They could turn it on. Watch what you're doing. They don't have to bug you. They just turn your phone's microphone on and on and on and on. 
So uh, this is why you kind of want to protect your Internet. And you really should not buy Internet of Things devices, whether it's a sous vide cooker or a toaster oven or a camera or even a router from companies that you don't trust. And more importantly, companies that kind of make a commitment to keep it up to date. And, you know, if at some point this company, Mellow, that makes this cooker goes out of business, I'm going to have to stop using the cooker because it won't be patched anymore. Nobody's going to fix it. Nobody's going to update it. It'll still work, but it could also be a gateway to my Internet. There are other ways. They're, they're kind of complicated that you could protect yourself. There are routers, and I, I suspect we'll see more of this, that allow you to create a secure subnetwork in your house. This is what would be the ideal that you put all your doorbells and your cookers and your ovens and your everything on this private subnetwork and it's protected it can't get into the rest of the network that would be the I ideal way to do it the only one i know of right now uh, it's nice it's an inexpensive router from ubiquity it's uh i think 50 dollars is the it's called the edge router x but it's but it's not for mortal man it's hard to figure. I mean, it took me a while to figure it out. And I, but uh, but it's a kind of cool device because it's exactly what it, it does. Is it allows you to say, all right, I'm going to put a Wi-Fi access point uh, on this subnetwork, and I don't. I'm going to have all of them. I'm going to have my Echo join it. I'm going to have my Google Assistant. I'm going to have everything join that, and they won't have the router. Edge router X will keep them from getting to the rest of my network. But this is this is kind of a black diamond tip. This is for the advanced users. It's a little complicated. I'm not even convinced <laughs> that I know what I'm doing. Uh, so caref careful. But uh, honestly, uh, th these are the kinds of things we're going to have to start thinking about. I, I don't have to. I mean, just look at what's going on in the world around us and how people are getting hacked. There is a botnet out there that really concerns me. It's called the Reaper. It is uh, a, a, a network of compromised devices, mostly routers, that, and there are many of them. I don't know how many it is. It was growing at 10,000 routers a day for a while. It's probably in the millions that somebody has compromised. We don't know who. We don't know who's controlling it. We can't stop them from controlling it. These are routers that haven't been patched, that have security flaws, and could be used in a variety of ways. It's probably based on the the the, the virus, the malware that's being used, uh, a nation, not an individual. It's pretty sophisticated. But we don't even know what they're going to use it for. If you want to read about it, just Google Reaper botnet and then be afraid. And that's an example of why the Internet of Things needs to be secured, not just for you and me and our privacy, but for the security of the Internet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. This week we'll learn about ARPA and its congressional status. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, with the November 17 rain report. ARPA, ARPA not to be confused with AARP, is the acronym for Amateur Radio Parity Act. If ARPA can find its way through Congress in 2018, hams who just dream about erecting outdoor antennas today may not have to dream about doing so anymore. So what's the skinny behind the Amateur Radio Parity Act? For some answers, Reigns Hap Holly KC9RP Turn to Michael Lysenko, N2YBB, Hudson Division Director for the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and Chair of the ARRL's Legislative Advocacy Committee. It is arguably one of the most important issues for facing amateur radio today, and that is almost exponential growth in people living in deed restricted communities throughout the entire country. At this point now, roughly 23% of all Americans live in a deed restricted community, meaning that they buy into a community that may have a homeowners association, they have covenants that come along with the land that they buy, and they find that there are many restrictions that they wind up inheriting when they move into a deed restricted community that will disallow the use of an outdoor external antenna or an antenna for that matter for any amateur use. 
And that's truly unfortunate because you have people who are moving into senior communities, folks who already live in deed restricted communities that are faced with not being able to practice both the service and the hobby of amateur radio because they're not allowed to have an outdoor antenna. And we all know that without an effective outdoor antenna or an effective antenna, you're just not going to be able to enjoy amateur radio. And so out of that realization came the understanding that we needed to do something. Otherwise, we had a hobby that was dying death by a thousand cuts. It's truly unfortunate that, that we find ourselves in this situation. But unfortunately, when you take a look at the realization that virtually 90% of all new home, housing starts are in deed restricted communities. And that comes about because uh, when a developer wants to develop a parcel of land, they go to a bank for a mortgage and a loan. The bank, of course, then says, well, we'll give you the money, but there are certain restrictions that you need to follow on the land so that we can get out of the loan as quickly as possible. And then you can sell the properties. Those covenants travel with the land. So by the time somebody purchases the property, the covenants that they agreed to are already in place and obviously create a situation where you really have no choice but to operate without an antenna if your homeowners association or if the deed says no antenna is allowed. Now, where is the bill now? The bill unfortunately is currently stalled in the Senate. This is the third congressional session in a row that we've had this bill. The first congressional session was in 2014 when we came up with HR 4969, which we were able to uh, develop a bill that garnered 69 co-sponsors in the House, which absolutely floored all of us because we didn't think that we would pick up that kind of support very quickly. And the support was bipartisan. Of course, we knew that by the time the bill dropped initially, it was late in that congressional session, and we knew that we'd have to come back in the next session, which was the 114th in uh, 2015. And 2015 and 2016, we were able to gather, I think it's now, it was about 126 co-sponsors for the bill. By the end of the session in 2016, we were able to get the bill through the House and into the Senate, which is where, unfortunately, it was placed on hold by the senior senator from Florida. And then Bill, unfortunately, died at that session. The next session, which started in January uh, 1st this year, three weeks into the first month, the bill passed with a number of other telecom bills, was sent over to the Senate. And unfortunately, we're running into the same kind of roadblock that we had the last session with the same issues being raised by Senator Nelson of Florida. And that's where we are right now with the bill. We've basically been working our tails off trying to find a way to either get it through the uh, Commerce Committee or any way we can get this bill passed. So that's where the story is at the moment. What is the primary roadblock that we're encountering? The primary roadblock really is the fact that the bill has been placed on hold by Senator Nelson who is not happy with the bill. The bill had been due for a markup, which meant it was to be moved out of committee into the floor in October. It was about 36 hours before the markup period, the markup meeting was supposed to occur. We were informed that if it came to markup, the senator would be moving an amendment to the bill that essentially would gut the bill completely. So we pulled the bill at that point because we didn't want the bill to run the risk of getting passed in the committee and then having to fight the bill because it, it completely turned everything we were asking for around. And bottom line is the roadblock, unfortunately, is the same one that's been for the past year. It's, it's the senior senator of Florida. Why is Senator Nelson opposed to this bill more than others? I don't know. He's never really fully articulated why the bill is being opposed by him, whether it be you know through him or through his staff. It could be a political decision, it could be a personal decision. I really don't know. All we know is that he has been very steadfast in his opposition to the bill. And we find that very frustrating given the, the work that we've done, especially in Florida, through the National Hurricane Center and, and of course, through the local MCOM groups, Aries and Races groups and, and NTS groups that have participated in providing communication support in time of need in Florida on a consistent basis, as well as all the work that we've done, you know, this year, just alone, Florida and Texas and Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, where amateur 
radio, especially in, in the Keys, in, in South Florida, in, in Puerto Rico, and BI, where we were critical in providing communications in those terribly affected areas by the hurricanes. It was not as much of a communications issue in Texas this year, despite the, the, the overwhelming destruction that was done there. Mainstream communications really didn't falter there. But in South Florida and the Keys and Puerto Rico, especially where we sent volunteers at the request of the Red Cross and the Virgin Islands as well, our participation in the communications aspect is overwhelmingly necessary. And, and the fact that these folks understand that and still are opposing what to us is a, a bill that doesn't have any opposition within the the um, homeowners associations. We negotiated with the National Association of Homeowners Associations, the Community Associations Institute, to come up with the legislation that uh, was acceptable to both sides. For them now, for uh, Senator Nelson to to uh, not support the uh, legislation to us is just mind boggling. It's very discouraging. It's, it's very upsetting. There really is no reason for it other than something that is bothering him that we just have no idea what it is maybe it's just my naivety and i am not a political animal at all what is the point of working on this bill not knowing what we can do you know you have to shake the tree and hope that one of those coconuts comes loose eventually. It's really incumbent upon us to bring this issue to the forefront because we realize that uh, without congressional support, it's uh, virtually impossible to get the FCC to, to do anything through an, a uh, proposal for rulemaking because in the past, the precedent that was set in the 96 Telecommunications Act, Congress told the FCC what to do and the FCC does not want to get involved in, in these issues without some sort of guidance from Congress. So, you know, we have to keep on chasing after it and, and hope at some point in some time, things will change. Sometimes it takes years to get legislation passed, and it could be the changing of the guard, it could be a change in, in demeanor or an understanding, but it's really incumbent upon us to try because we have so many members who are now living in deed restricted communities that are affected by the inability to put an antenna up. Just put yourselves in their shoes. If you lived in a deed restricted community and you couldn't get an antenna outside, even a simple antenna that would be aesthetically neutral, but effective so that you could work the bands that you wanted to work. The ARRL is the advocate for amateur radio. It's really incumbent upon us to keep on trying. What is it about the Amateur Radio Parity Act that makes it so much better than what we've had in PRB1. PRB1 came about because the FCC realized that amateur radio operators were being forced to go through unreasonable situations to get the ability to put up antenna structures on their property in communities that had municipal zoning boards. Now, municipal zoning boards, of course, these are, these are public issues. And so, the FCC decided that in order to protect amateur radio from dying a death by being regulated out of existence, came up with PRB1, which essentially allowed for the reasonable accommodation of amateur radio operators that uh, they could not preclude communications for amateur radio. And they had to do this in a way that with the least practicable restrictive ruling so that they would work their way to accommodate amateur radio operators. Now, the problem is, is that the FCC at the time was asked to extend it to all forms of land use, but they felt that uh, private land use uh, restrictions had nothing to do with them. They didn't have the authority to do anything about it because it was private land. That, of course, changed in 96 when Congress told the FCC to allow for any type of television reception antenna, as long as there's no more than 12 feet off the height of the roof, or um, a three foot in diameter uh, satellite uh, television disc. And they did that because they wanted to get out of regulating cable television rates. They set a precedent for the FCC that they could now deal with uh, private uh, land use restrictions because obviously the preclusion to was to all types of land use in terms of the Telecommunications Act. We went back to them again in 96 after that was passed and said, well, look, it doesn't make any sense that you could allow for a TV antenna, which could be substantially much larger than an amateur radio antenna, and not allow it for us. And they said, well, you know, We'd love to help you guys, but Congress told us what to do and they didn't include you. So if you want us to do this, 
go back to Congress. And it took a while, but we finally did that. There's the genesis of the Amateur Radio Parody Act. That's our first of two excerpts from a Skype conversation Reigns Hap Holly, KC9RP, had with Michael Losenko, N2YBB, chair of the ARRL's Legislative Advocacy Committee and ARRL Hudson Division Director. So what's the status of ARPA as we approach 2018? We'll find out next time. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio. You know when you walk down the street and you lift your foot and all of a sudden you realize that you stepped in something and now it's stuck to your shoe? I had that feeling during the week. Last week I mentioned that I had purchased a TCXO, a temperature controlled external oscillator. Lowell, November Echo 4 Echo Bravo, set me straight by pointing out that XO stood for crystal and TCXO stood for temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which then led me on a merry goose chase trying to learn about all that. I mention this because while the stickiness on my shoe kept me busy, it also highlighted that I'm still a babe in the woods on a steep learning curve to knowledge with some roadblocks, diversions and potholes along the way. That reminds me, if you ever feel the urge to pull me up on something I've said, you can email me via my call sign at gmail.com. So how does this temperature compensated crystal oscillator actually work? Without getting into the security behind the scenes, as I mentioned previously, a crystal oscillates and the frequency is dependent on temperature. Turns out this is a predictable curve, which makes it possible to account for changes in temperature. In addition to keeping the temperature stable, another way to keep the frequency of a crystal stable is to have an electrical circuit that changes depending on temperature and have that create something like an opposing curve so you can add the two together and end up with a pretty stable frequency. Before you start asking how exactly, let me just remind you of the shoe with the stickiness on it. In essence, you have something like a resistor that changes resistance depending on temperature. It's a component called a thermistor, and that in turn affects a resonant circuit, also known as an electronic oscillator or LC circuit, which in turn affects the circuit that is driving the crystal. These days, most if not all of that is on a chip, and you get a neat little package that you can plug into your radio to give it frequency stability and hopefully accuracy. I did say I was going to talk about accuracy this week, but the doo-doo I stepped in put a swift halt to that. Besides, now I know that there is a thing called a thermistor, the second portmanteau I ever learned, together with Jerry Mander, so there's that. Ah, also Tanzania, Eurasia and Oxbridge. Back to amateur radio. The oven controlled crystal I mentioned last week. They exist in high-end measuring gear, not in the $26 TCXO I have installed in my radio. While I'm on the subject, you can also compensate for temperature with software, using either a purpose-built microprocessor or even the host processor that is using the crystal. But that gets into magic self-referencing voodoo pretty quickly. And while I've been playing, Japan is finally being received here and I heard a station 18,656 kilometers away during the week. Mind you, Alpha Alpha 3 Golf Zulu in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, on the Atlantic Ocean side of the United States, was putting out 100 watts, so there's that. I'll leave you with a thought that I hope to be able to answer next week. If your radio has a crystal that determines what frequency it's tuned to, how do you use that to determine the accuracy of the frequency? More self-references, just because I can, and besides, I'm a software developer and recursion is part of my makeup. I'll give you a hint. It's not all to do with megahertz. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Jim Kovocic, K8JK of Brighton, Michigan, has been appointed as Michigan Section Manager for the first half of next year. His appointment will begin on January 1st, 2018, and will continue through June 30th. Kovocic was appointed by AWRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fossaro, W3IZ, in consultation with AWRL Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, and outgoing Michigan Section Manager Larry Camp, WB8R. Camp, who has served as Section Manager since 2012, intends to step down from the volunteer position on December 31st when his term of office concludes. 
An AWRL life member, Kovochik was licensed in 1968. He has been active in many facets of amateur radio, including public service, experimenting, and equipment restoration. He currently serves as an assistant emergency coordinator and a volunteer examiner. He is president, newsletter editor, and technical director for the Livingston Amateur Radio Club. Kovochik's appointment will bridge the gap until a section manager is elected in Michigan. According to the rules and regulations of the field organization, when a section manager vacancy occurs between elections, the position is filled by appointment. The Michigan appointment was necessary because no candidate was nominated to succeed camp by the time the deadline for section manager nominations arrived in September. The same situation exists in the AWRL East Bay, New Mexico, and Santa Barbara sections. Nominations are being resolicited in all four sections for candidates to serve an 18-month term of office starting on July 1, 2018. The resolicitation will appear in the January and February 2018 issues of QST. Section manager nomination forms and related information are also available on the AWRL website. The Ladies CubeSat in the Fox series, Fox 1B, launched on November 18th from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The Delta II vehicle lifted off at 0948 UTC. Following a picture-perfect launch, Red Faxat was deployed at 1109 UTC, AMSAT reported. Then the wait began. At 1212 UTC, the AMSAT engineering team, watching ZR6AIC's web SDR waterfall, saw the characteristic foxtail of the Fox 1 series FM transmitter, confirming the satellite was alive and transmitting over South Africa. Shortly after 1234 UTC, the first telemetry was received and uploaded to AMSAT servers by Maurizio Balducci, IV3RYQ in Italy. Initial telemetry confirmed that the satellite was healthy. In wake of this successful launch, deployment, and reception, Oscar number administrator Bill Tynan, W3XO, designated the new satellite as AMSAT Oscar 91 or AO 91. As we go to air, AO 91 has been open for general use. AMSAT Engineering officially announced that AO-91 was ready for use at 0650 UTC on Thanksgiving Day, November 23rd. AMSAT VP of Engineering Jerry Buxton, N0JY, turned over operations to Mark Hammond, NAMH, and AMSAT operations during the contact of AO-91 repeater during the pass over eastern U.S., AMSAT said in a bulletin. The latest CubeSat in the Fox series was launched on November 18th from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Telemetry is downlink via the DUV subaudible telemetry stream, which can be decoded using Fox Telem software. A 1U CubeSat Rad Fox Sat Fox 1B is a joint mission of AMSAT and the Institute for Space and Defense Electronics at Vanderbilt University. AMSAT constructed the rest of the satellite, including the space frame, onboard computer, and power system. The amateur radio package is similar to that on AO85 with an uplink on 435.250 MHz with a 67.0 CTCSS and a downlink on 145.96 MHz. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The International Amateur Radio Union, or IARU, says significant progress was made during World Radio Communication Conference 2019 preparations that took place earlier this month at International Telecommunications Union headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. But the IARU cautioned that a lot remains to be done before the reservations and concerns of regulators and Spectrum users are adequately satisfied. The team representing IARU in Working Party 5A of ITU radio communications sector consisted of amateurs from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Ireland, Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. For IARU, the main focus was on the WRC 19 agenda item that will consider an amateur radio allocation in Region 1 from 50 to 54 megahertz that is similar to the one available in Regions 2 and 3. The current, mainly secondary allocation of 50 to 52 megahertz in most European countries is a regional agreement. Delegates to the meeting considered input documents from IARU France, the Russian Federation, and Switzerland were considered. A rough consensus 
was achieved on the text that will provide the technical basis for discussions concerning the access to 50 to 54 megahertz for the amateur service in Region 1. Additionally, some administrations accepted an IARU proposed method to calculate the spectrum needs of the amateur service at 50 to 54 megahertz, but more information to justify the requested bandwidth will be required, the IARU said. For sharing studies, particularly in relation to the land mobile service and radio location applications in the 50 to 54 megahertz allocation, a mutually agreed upon propagation model remains to be determined. No major objections remain to sharing with analog television broadcasting in the 50 to 54 megahertz band in region one, provided that a time limited field strength limit is applied. Other key issues affecting the amateur service remain to be addressed prior to WRC 19. These include securing protection for amateur service primary allocations at 24 gigahertz and 47 gigahertz, and minimizing possible interference arising from wireless power transmission for the charging of electric vehicles. Following the meeting of Working Party 5A and other meetings related to the work of ITU-R Study Group 5, the ITU hosted the first of three planned inter-regional workshops on WRC-19 preparation. IARU Vice President Ole Garpestad, LA2RR, who also attended the WP5A meeting, represented the IARU at the workshop to hear reports on progress by the regional telecommunication organizations. And finally this week, an odd but intriguing experiment in technology, diplomacy, governance, and space exploration, among other things, has officially begun its journey. After being delayed one day, an orbital ATK and Terry's rocket carrying a CubeSat named Asgardia-1 launched from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia early Sunday. The milk carton-sized satellite makes up the entirety of territory of the self-proclaimed Space Kingdom of Asgardia, Asgardia Space Kingdom has now established its sovereign territory in space, read an online statement. Over 300,000 people signed up online to become citizens of the nation over the last year. The main privilege of citizenship so far involves the right to upload data to Asgardia 1 for safekeeping in orbit, seemingly far away from the pesky governments and law of earthbound countries. But if you really dig down into Asgardia's terms and conditions, you'll find that those privileges are still subject to earthly copyright laws. They're set up under the laws of Austria. As of now, Asgardia's statehood isn't acknowledged by any other actual countries or the United Nations, and it doesn't really even fit the definition of a nation since it's not possible for a human to physically live in Asgardia. Not yet, at least. The long-term vision of Asgardia includes human settlements in space, on the moon, and perhaps even more distant colonies. For now, though, Asgardia is a tiny satellite inside a Cygnus spacecraft set to dock with the International Space Station Tuesday morning. There, Asgardia-1 will patiently wait while Orbital ATK completes its primary mission to resupply the ISS. After about a month, the Cygnus will detach and climb to a higher altitude where the nation in a box will be deployed into orbit. We'll see if the activation of Asgardia-1 heralds the beginning of a new era of extraplanetary citizenship or if it slowly fades into obscurity with each trip around our planet and its nearly 200 more conventional nations. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, Amateur Radio Newsletters from Around the World, Sources on the Internet, and the Packet Bulletin Board Systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on the amateur bands all around North America and around the world on great low-power radio stations like World FM on 88.2 MHz, serving Auckland, New Zealand. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. 
Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.